Welcome to Chatting the Pictures. My name is Kara Finnegan, and I'm a writer, teacher, and historian of photography. And I'm Michael Shaw. I'm a writer, a psychologist, and also a publisher of Reading the Pictures. And I'm Pete Brook, a writer, curator, and educator focused on prisons, power, and photography. Photos and videos taken by inmates are rarely seen by the general public. However, the impact of COVID-19 on the federal prison system has led to some notable exceptions. The images we're discussing today were published by Vice as part of a collaboration with the Marshall Project. They were part of an article titled, I Begged Them to Let Me Die, How Federal Prisons Became Coronavirus Death Traps. For this discussion, we're pleased to be joined by Pete Brook. As the publisher of the photo blog, Prison Photography, Pete is one of the foremost experts on photography and incarceration. These images were made by Dion Main and posted on Facebook. According to the caption, federal prisoners in Milan, Michigan, used a contraband cell phone to post a video on social media about grim conditions they faced during the pandemic. During our discussion today, we'll also be looking at a pair of images that were made by prisoner Aaron Campbell and posted on social media from the Elkton, Ohio federal prison. He said he was sent to the hole as punishment for posting a video on Facebook that showed sick inmates packed together in dormitory-style housing units. It might not be clear looking at these images that they are screen grabs from videos. Vice and the Marshall Project have taken a decision to use this filter, which adds this sort of like antique aesthetic layer over the top of them. Now, we have known that cell phones have been used in their hundreds of thousands across the 6,000 locked facilities in the U.S. for years. But 99.9% of the use of cell phones is personal. Prisoners who have them do not want to be detected. So what's interesting here is that these images, stills and moving images, have become central to the reporting on the crisis inside of prisons. The videos themselves have been pretty amazing, haven't they? The video from Dion Main, he's showing rooms full of prisoners in bunk beds. He's holding up meager cleaning supplies. He's even holding up a copy of legislation that he's asking people who see the video to help support. Some people who think they know of the prison system think of cell tiers and solitary confinement wings and rows and rows of cages and locked boxes. But what we see in both these videos is the open dormitory style. Now, of course, the open dormitory style is used in minimum security facilities and the types of prisoners who are housed in minimum security prisoners are the ones who are considered by the administrations to be not a threat. So that includes nonviolent offenders. That includes elderly people. That includes people who are demonstrably infirm, the types of prisoners who are susceptible most to the COVID virus. doesn't look like the types of prisons that we are exposed to in the popular media. Pete, I'm really struck by your point that prisoners, rather than using their phones for themselves, are essentially inviting us into their experience. What do you think this shift from the private use of the phone to the public means in terms of the way that those of us on the outside look at or think about prisons? What do these images help us see that maybe we haven't seen in any other way? I mean, let's be frank, their first and foremost interest here is their self-preservation, like any of us. If you're trapped in a box with people who are ailing, you want to protect yourself. But then because of that, we do get to see them up close. They're addressing us. In protecting themselves, they are revealing themselves, allowing us a moment to see them as named individuals, right? Obviously, the demand gaze, the urgency from both men is inescapable. But I think the masks are also really interesting. And in the Vice article, what you also see is another pairing of images. And it's pretty ironic that a certain number of masks have actually been manufactured in prisons for the general public. But when you look at those masks in those two photographs, not only are they soiled, which means that the masks are at a premium, but they're not exactly N95s either. What strikes me is on the outside, we're watching videos of grown men having tantrums in supermarkets because they're being asked to wear a mask. And people are trying to source some logic and some sort of like heroic grasp on freedom in that stupid claim. Whereas people we've disposed of in society are acutely, highly, very aware of the immediate danger. Not only are wearing masks, but are demanding to know how effective 
those masks are. And these are people who have been thrown away and most people would not credit with any intelligence, but we understand for a long time the judgments and the prejudices we bring to incarcerated folks. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the aesthetic of these screen grabs, essentially, these photo illustrations that have been pulled from the videos, which, as Pete pointed out, are different from the videos. The videos look like actually pretty good cell phone video. They are obviously made on the fly, first person, in the way that you would expect somebody trying to do this kind of live streaming or recording of videos on a phone. But they are in color. They're clear, right? They feature a lot of direct address by the men who are making them. And then Vice has pulled screen grabs that are visually compelling in a really different way. Pete, as you said, they have a kind of older, almost tintype look to my eyes, aesthetic. They're black and white. They, in some cases, the images on the right side of these images we're looking at, they're grabbing something that looks kind of fuzzy and distorted. And I'm trying to decide how I feel about that. On the one hand, I think the videos themselves, as they emerged in color and in their clarity, offer better documentary evidence. But at the same time, there's something about these still screen grabs that have been turned into photo illustrations that is also compelling. I think particularly the close-up portraits of the two men recording the videos. For me, there's a couple of things going on here. Cara, to your point that they are tintypey, I see what you're saying, but for me, they're more like newspaper, black and white image at any point in the 20th century where the newsprint makes the image grainy and grayscale. And if I wanted to extrapolate that out more, I start thinking about Ouija and the fascination with tabloid newspapers in the 40s and 50s and 60s and those sort of like illicit images that the flashbulb allowed the public to see, images of car crashes, images of crime scenes, etc. So these images for me trigger a response and a memory of 20th century newspaper photographs, which may or may not be deliberate on the part of the designer. The second thing is, though, in these two diptychs, it's almost as if taken the still version of what happens when you flip the camera on a cell phone. These are not synchronous moments, but we can imagine if either of these two guys flip the camera, then it goes to a view from their face to what's at the bottom of their bed, which is their fellow prisoner ailing. It may not be obvious, but the more I look at them, the more I consider that these two images may be representative of the camera and the face camera on a cell phone flipped in real time. I do agree that there's a throwback newspaper aesthetic here. Makes me think that people are so inundated, not just with visual information, but also a particular style, that the cell phone videos that are in the article probably don't have the same kind of impact as a treatment like this. I think the reference to Ouija is really interesting to me because Ouija is someone who snuck around and got the pictures you weren't supposed to get, right? He was always there at the right time catching that moment when it's dark and moody and dangerous, right? And to the extent that Vice is own a aesthetic and own ethos kind of traffics in that also. These images certainly do seem consistent with their approach. I think Michael's point is well taken that maybe looking at the quote unquote traditional video evidence sadly might not have as much of a visual impact on people as images like these that we're studying here. The design decisions here may be an unconscious reaction to the fact that we still consider black and white images as being more serious or more legally binding or more evidentiary. Even in the way they've set up this cork board border or brown paper border, it makes it look like it's coming out of an evidence file from a metal filing cabinet in some DA's office. But it's specifically been put together for an online presentation. So, you know, I have this discussion with my students all the time, and they always tell me that the photography in black and white is more serious. And of course, it's not the case. I think when we look at how these diptychs reduce the content of those videos, that allows us to then start drawing conclusions from the content matter. On the one hand, we have the direct address from the person that's making the video. And on the other hand, we have sort of like this illicit voyeuristic close view, but without any indication that the subject is aware. If we only had these photographs, it wouldn't be clear if the figures in these beds were alive or not. These sorts of photo illustrations can and should be viewed as part of a fuller package of evidence, which produces a very powerful indictment, not only a visual indictment, against the Bureau of Prisons and their handling of COVID-19. 